Well, I had this uh, wonderful, elaborate PowerPoint, including lots of embedded videos and all kinds of good things, but in, uh, in my rush to do all the things I've been doing this last week, I missed the memo that I was supposed to submit it a day early to be sure that it was technically feasible. And so now I'm going to wing it, which is my absolutely worst possible condition. So, <clears throat> anyway. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm deeply honored to be here, of course. This is uh, my second straight year at the Public Banking Institute. Um, I'm going to give you a little different look at uh, monetary reform. Uh, than I've talked about before, but this represents my core beliefs of what I think is the nut of what's at the core of what's being done to us and what we need to try to prevent. So uh, what is, what's been the most important theme of the last thousand years of human history? Uh, the most important development, in my opinion, has been in the political realm. It's been humankind's escape from serfdom the development of self-governance. And I think this is what's really on the line here, whether humankind can successfully self-govern. So what is serfdom? Serfdom is a lack of freedom. See, now I had nice slides for all this. <laughs> uh, it's a lack of having much say over how we're governed. It's a lack of being able to own property, the fruits of our labors. And most importantly, it's the law of the jungle instead of a real system of equal justice for all, the rule of law. So these are the characteristics of serfdom. So what are the characteristics of freedom? Effective self-governance, not what we have today, incidentally. Laws are made with the consent of the governed, of we the people. Uh, protection of private property rights. And the rule of law, a system of uh, justice that treats all citizens equally under laws created by the consent of the governed. Uh, attaining increased freedom means moving from a very sharp power pyramid, and I'm going to demonstrate this graphic myself, a human graphic. This is a very steep power pyramid, right? To a very broad-based power pyramid. Very fast, uh, very slow, very uh, inefficient, very expensive, but very, very safe. So uh, this, uh, the broad power pyramid is, is where everyone votes on all the rules, or when everyone votes on all the rules, that's called democracy. When we elect people we trust to make the rules, that's called a republic. However, there is a theoretical third way to conduct governance that I'm particularly upset about, having uh, made a little libertarian presidential run last year. I, I found out the inside of all this. Uh, I don't think it works. I think it's kind of like a quark in a nuclear physics laboratory. It's, it's in theory and you can make it happen, but it's very fleeting and uh, uh, self-destructs. This third theoretical uh, way, so to speak, is called anarchy, the lack of any government. And we, this, this is kind of worming its way into our political dimension, and I don't think we really realize it, so I'm, I'm trying to point that out. Uh, the anarchist view is essentially that humans are incapable of effective self-governance. Uh, their belief system is that governments rule over the populace by force of arms and therefore are basically illegitimate. Anarchists completely ignore the fact that self-governance has been an essential part of humankind's escape from serfdom. This may seem like Government 101, but this is very, a very important distinction because it confuses a lot of people. Some version of this anarchist view dominates, as I said before, about one-third of the Libertarian Party. So their solution is to abolish government. Now, I know this doesn't make much sense. Why start a political party where the core belief is to abolish government? I could never figure this out to the point where I didn't really believe that was true, but it's true. The, about one-third of the core of the Libertarian Party, they, they have these little secret anarchist signs and numbers and stuff, and they think it's really cool, and it just it blew my mind. Anyway, ho however, I agree with them that governments uh, in general are out of control at this point, 
Uh, but the question is out of whose control? So today, does government look more like this, a very broad-based power pyramid, or does it look more like this, a very steep power pyramid? Right, it's, it's out of control. So uh, now in the very steep power pyramid, very few people share political power, and the bottom layers of the power pyramid uh, feel very far removed from the decision makers. So certainly this, this steep power pyramid is the iconograph, as I call it, for uh, governments today, and not just in this country, this is a worldwide phenomenon. So uh, yes, power is getting more and more consolidated, and everything I do, everything I'm about, is about deconsolidation of power to the maximum extent that is politically practical. You can't just have a power pyramid like this, it's just nothing will happen. But so there's some balance in between here. Okay. As a result, most people here certainly feel that uh, they have very little say in their governance anymore. So this consolidation of power is now moving so fast that most people can even see it. They just don't know what to do about it. I say there's only one way to get from this pyramid to this pyramid, and that is to re it is not to um, discard self-governance altogether. Why? The old saying is that power abhors a vacuum. If we, the little people, don't move into collectively form some sort of governance in the public interest, then there's only one power out there that will rapidly seize power like a hungry wolf. And that power is the money power. I call, in my first film, I call them the money masters for want of a better name. The money masters want to discredit self-governance as obsolete, an anachronism, an experiment that has failed. Don't fall for that line. Government, government is all, self-government is all we've got. That's the only way where we the people we, the little people, can combine all of our little bits of power to effectively um, counter them. And uh, as Sal Ellen said before, we just have to get all those leaves of grass pointing in the same direction. And so that's kind of what I'm about today. I'm, I'm going to try to hammer home what I think is, is really the only path. And I don't know if I can do it without my illustrations, but I'm going to try. So uh, the bad guys love it when Congress polls record low numbers. That's why they trumpet these numbers uh, from their controlled media. They want you to abandon self-governance. Why? Because self-governance is their only effective competition. Remember what John D. Rockefeller's motto was, competition is sin. The money masters will always, always, always use their great wealth to seek to control the political power with their money power. I agree with one of the main authors of the U.S. Constitution, Gouverneur Morris, and I love this quote. I'm going to have to take a drink of water before I read it. Because this is, this is nerve-wracking. I'm, I'm a horrible speaker. I'm, I'm, Ellen's better than me. <laughs> And the quote is, the rich will strive to establish their dominion and enslave the rest. They always did, they always will. They will have the same effect here as elsewhere if we do not, by the power of government, keep them in their proper spheres. Now, we're not talking French Revolution where we go and kill those guys. We're not going to steal their money. We, the focus here is perfect. We have to keep them in their proper spheres. As William Jennings Bryan said in his Cross of Gold speech, uh, we, we, it's not that uh, government should go out of the money business, it's that the, the money power should go out of the governing business. I think this is where our great experiment in self-governance has gone wrong. We have failed to keep the rich in their proper spheres. We have utterly failed to appreciate the profundity of this quotation, which you should be seeing on your screen now. I guess I'm not supposed to continually point out my failings, but whatever. So, uh, freedom is never just given to us in perpetuity. It has to be continually struggled for. 
but you can't do it uh, through the violent revolution system. I loved what, what the, the gentleman who preceded me, the way he put it, that was exactly right. That only leads, if we, even if we were to succeed by that method, what type of a power pyramid would we be creating? We'd be creating just another one of these with just different rulers at the top. The only way we can do this is the way that previous gentleman said. We have to create a very broad-based power pyramid. It's, maybe it's going to take some time, but I, I've always thought, and I, I've said for the last several years, that we're coming to a tipping point. I know in my own email traffic and YouTube comment traffic and Facebook traffic that this is a worldwide phenomenon. I did a, a radio show uh, for uh, a guy in Tokyo. He was a British, had a British accent. He was a British guy, I think he was 28, and he said all of his peers, monetary reform is all they want to talk about. So we are having an impact and a tipping point's going to be reached. What's the tipping point? It's where nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and all of a sudden critical mass is achieved, boom, and it happens, and everybody goes, oh, we knew that all along anyway. <laughs> and that's the way it's going to happen. So you, you can't be depressed or let yourself th think that nothing's happening. That's just typical of these type of political situations, and this is the biggest political situation of them all. I mean, what's at stake here is nothing less than the sustainability of humanity itself. Ellen, can, can I be done now? Or... Okay, I, a, little, a little longer? <laughs> I can't hear you, I'm too old. It's okay, it's okay, I'm, I'll go. Let's, let's see what Ellen is. Just let me follow my script, okay? The, this this will make sense. Otherwise, I'll, I'll get lost. Or I, I could ask I could ask questions from the audience. That would work too. So anyway, what we've got to do here we're we're outside of the rule of law completely now. The financial sector is is just running wild, amok, and without restraint. So there there are only two basic alternatives, as I said before. There's no in-between. You either have the rule of law or you have the law of the jungle. Now, I doubt that anybody in this room, especially anybody who is a parent, would vote for their family to, to be ruled under the law of the jungle at this point. So really, the rule of law is all we have. And it always leads to, the rule of the jungle always leads to this steep power pyramid. And, uh, you know, I've been called a statist for this by, by libertarians and uh, the whole gold money crowd and all that because they, they say, oh, you're, you're pushing big government. You know, not at all. I'm pushing the, the governance of the, that was designed by the U.S. Constitution, which is that balance, that broad power pyramid, but, but still not so broad that it can't effectively govern. So now I just, uh, I believe that history has shown that the only way to avoid the steep power pyramid is with self-governance, a broad-based support where we the people are the sovereigns and we grant limited power to the governments through the Constitution. Now, Ellen just told me to go back in history because the history of money, and that's where I'm going right now. <laughs> uh, just calm down, it'll be okay. She knows, she knows how bad I am at this. In any case, in English history, self-governance pretty much started with, uh, with King Henry I. He was the son of uh, uh, William the Conqueror. He was the first Norman king of England. Uh, he was known as the Lion of Justice. Uh, Henry took the English throne in 1100 AD, and at that time, 90% of the peasants were under serfdom. They owned no property. They basically worked for the company's store. Henry was an interesting guy. He was the first uh, English monarch to start this deconsolidation of power process that virtually led to serfdom being outlawed in England nearly 500 years later. In 1100 AD, he proclaimed the Charter of Liberties, also known as the Coronation Charter, because it was issued on the day that he was crowned king. The Charter of Liberties was revolutionary. It was, it was the founding document in English law and served as a forerunner to the Magna Carta, which was issued 215 years later, and yet probably you all have never heard of the, of the Coronation Charter. King Henry was smart enough to realize that in the Coronation Charter that it would be worthless unless he broke the power of the money masters 
uh, that the money masters held over the most basic necessity of a nation, money, the medium of exchange we all need to trade for things uh, that we buy. So in Declaration no Number 5, King Henry forbid the most common form of seniorage by anyone but the sovereign. Now, I don't know if you all know what seniorage is, but when the U.S. government, then the, let's just pretend that the U.S. government was doing the right thing and it was creating money in the public interest, and so it would print a $100 bill and it would cost them three cents. So that difference between three cents and the value, that's the seniorage. Um, seniorage is the ability to make profit off the issuance of money. This, of course, is exactly what commercial banks of today are doing when they practice fractional reserve lending and so thereby all of us monetary reformers say we have to take back the money power and that's what we're talking about. We're taking back the seniorage as well as the ability to control the quantity. Like I always say, it doesn't matter what backs your money, all that matters is who controls the quantity. And right now, we the people, through our elected representatives, have absolutely no control over the quantity of money except for uh, quarters, except for the small change. We, we certainly don't have anything, any control over the rest of it. So if all that isn't bad enough, it doesn't even stop there bit, uh, as far as the money masters, the, the, the banker class having control of uh, the quantity of money at this point. There's an additional layer of injustice in this story yet. Since goldsmiths were creating 90% of the money through their, their counterfeiting operation, um, Okay, I got to back up a little bit. What was happening in King Henry's time was, was the goldsmiths uh, just uh, would would bring in people's gold because they had they had the safe vault, and uh, they would give the people a receipt for their gold. And so the goldsmith had physical possession of all the gold, and he'd give out these receipts. Well. The goldsmiths found out that people would, only about 10% of the population would actually want to come in and retrieve uh, their physical gold for their receipt. So the goldsmiths started uh, handing out more paper receipts or lending out extra paper receipts into the economy and deriving the interest therefrom, even though those paper receipts were completely worthless. They were, it was a complete counterfeiting operation. So uh, what the goldsmiths then found out was if uh, since they had control of the 90% of the money, uh, that uh, what they could do is they could control the entire English economy by operating in concert, by either making their gold coins plenty or lending out more paper receipts than they actually had liberally, then it caused a bubble, just like what we call the Roaring Twenties. Um, and then, then if they wanted to, uh, in concert, contract the amount of money in circulation by calling in their loans, that would cause a, a depression, a deflationary depression. Well, and so what the goldsmiths could do, they found out, was that all they'd have to do is threaten the king with this depression, and then the king would do, it, do what he wanted. So King Henry, you know, being uh, uh, a liberal type of guy, a, a, a thinker type of person said, I want to break that power. You know, the goldsmiths are actually the sovereigns. They're making the decisions because uh, they can threaten to crash the economy because they've got uh, the money power. And so he created uh, this thing called tally sticks, uh, which uh, I'm the only one who's actually filmed the thing. So I, I've been in the Bank of England Museum three times. I, I went there again for this latest film. And I finally asked John Keyworth, who's the curator of the Bank of England Museum, how come nobody else has filmed tally sticks, only me? And he goes, nobody else has asked. <laughs> and I thought he was doing me some special favor, but you know, he just, he's, he, he's got control of all the remaining English tally sticks. So any, anyway, um, the king I issued these sticks uh, as a receipt for tax payments, and then because everybody had to pay taxes, they started circulating as money, and uh, he found out that through this method, uh, he was actually taking some of the money power back onto him, and he liked that. And the tally stick system worked very well, and it survived for 600 years until the Bank of England in uh, 1694 came in, killed the tally stick system, uh, and uh, got the government to start borrowing money essentially from private bankers. And so that was the end of that. So, uh, I just went through all of this in the short version. Okay, now let's, let's leap uh, forward 800 years to the J.P. Morgan era to see this at work because the whole point of this is it's the same thing that goes on time and time again, year after year, century after century, the same scam. 
And unless we understand what they're doing, we can't understand how we're going to fix it. On March 11, 1891, the nation was theoretically on a gold money system, but there were still some silver certificates, there were still some greenbacks in, in circulation, but uh, 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 primarily the, the money of the day was gold. The vast majority of uh, money, however, the vast majority of money was counterfeit money created by banks. Once again, the, the gold bugs think, oh, well, we should return to a hard money system because therefore we can control the quantity because you can't just manufacture gold out of nothing. Wrong. You know, we saw this all the way back into the, in the pre-tally stick system. Um, the vast majority of money is created by banks in the form of interest-bearing loans. It's not money like in your, in your wallet. So that, that's where the, the gold-only money people fail. In any case, on March 11, 1891, a memorandum was circulated by the bankers, uh, by the by the American Banking Association instructing bankers to create a depression on a certain date three years into the future. Uh, that date was September 1st, 1894, and the, the quotation, and this was right out of the congressional record, on September 1st, 1894, we will not renew our loans under any consideration. On September 1st, we will demand our money. We will foreclose and become mortgagees in possession. We can take two-thirds of the farms west of the Mississippi and thousands of them east of the Mississippi as well at our own price. Then the farmers will become tenants as in England, close quote. So that's uh, a pretty astounding quote. So, Yes, indeed, bankers, even in our day, still create depressions and bubbles to make money no matter which way uh, the pendulum, their pendulum, swings. But it gets worse. The, the ancient uh, goldsmiths also uh, discovered that by creating these depressions, they could uh, e exert this hidden, powerful force over the king, uh, which I've already talked about. So, uh, let's leap forward again to... Uh, uh, October 24th, 1929, Black Thursday. According to historian John Kenneth Galbraith, writing in The Great Crash of 29, uh, Bernard Baruch brought Winston Churchill into the visitor's gallery of the New York Stock Exchange to witness the panic that was about to ensue to impress him with his power. Churchill was then Chancellor, uh, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, the equivalent of the American Secretary of Treasury, and the panic uh, ensued. Uh, Congressman Lewis McFadden, Chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee from 1921 to 1931, knew whom to blame the stock market crash on. He accused the Fed and the international bankers of orchestrating the crash. This was his quote. It was not accidental. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. The international bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair here where they might emerge as rulers of us all, close quote. So the point again is that down through the centuries, call them the money masters, call them the goldsmiths, call them the money trust, as uh, the Peugeot Committee uh, did uh, in uh, 1912, 1913, or simply call them bankers. It's the same old game played over and over, and all they have to do to keep their scheme going is to divert not only the American people, but the people of every nation um, from figuring out what the root cause of the problem is. And as, we see, as we'll see in today's world, the Fed spends about half a billion dollars a year right now doing just that to keep the economics, academic community in line. And this is just startling. I'm so sorry that we, we can't show the, the video of actual professors saying, you know, it, it's, if you don't change your research to be in line with the Fed, uh, you don't have research and you can't get tenure, you can't remain at the university. The Fed absolutely has a lock now on the academic community. and that's. Uh, without the academic community, then there's no support for the press to really go out of line and say anything different. And so uh, it's uh, a situation that we're in, but we're, we can tackle it, and the tipping point's coming. You know, back to, back to the gold bugs. Uh, <clears throat> The, the philosophical reason that gold cannot be the primary uh, form of the nation's money is that gold is, uh, is the ultimate 
in uh, centralized, a centralized form of money. It, it never operates in the public interest. Gold is concentrated money. Um, uh, gold bugs hate it when I point this out, but uh, there is, uh, J.P. Morgan wrote his brother one time, and I just discovered this quote, like last year, doing the research for the, the new film, and it, it's just startling. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope it has the full weight by me just reading it. As a man of sense, I am a gold bug and support a gold bug government and a gold bug society. As a man of the world, I like confusion, anarchy, and war. So that pretty much says it as far as connecting the anarchy thing with the war thing and the confusion thing. It's all tied up into one big, that's how they operate. Who said that? J.P. Morgan, writing to his brother in an 1895 letter to his brother, I forget his brother's name. Now it was right out of uh, the Morgan biography by Jane Strauss. So if I can accomplish just two things by this visit, it would be to hammer home these two points. Number one, instead of abolishing government, we have to take back government. And number two, that gold cannot serve the public interest as the and be the, it cannot be the primary form of, of money because it cannot ever possibly serve the public interest. So, it can never serve the interest of the commonwealth. It always serves the interest of the money masters, those who will seize back this thousand-year outbreak of human freedom and put we, the 99%, back into our serfdom shoes just as soon as they can do so, if they've not already accomplished that. And I don't think they have accomplished that. And I think, I know the rest of the world looks towards us as uh, whether, you know, it, our system looks great to us or not. The rest of the world still looks towards us as the keepers of freedom, as the leading edge of the people who have the best chance of solving this. Now, I just want to say that the gold and silver coin have uh, an important place to play in the money system as a complementary currency. That's why I was the only monetary reformer to sign on to the Utah Legal Tender Act. Uh, this was the first of its kind in the United States when it was passed, I think, two years ago. It allows gold and silver coinage issued by the U.S. government to be legal tender in the state of Utah. And they've, they've fought this battle uh, throughout the states, and so, uh, most states have, I think Utah is still the only state that's passed it. Maybe one other state has, but that's uh, really... So I have no problem with this. Monetary reformers should not fear gold or silver coin. And the reason is, is that um, they have, they have a, a cost of use. In other words, you have to have gold assayed. It's just not as uh, uh, fungible as, as, uh, as properly issued, uh, government-issued money. So we, we don't really have anything to fear as, from them being as a, a complementary currency. In addition, a rightfully configured debt-free government-issued money, greenbacks or U.S. notes, have zero cost of use. Any trading of physical commodities have a cost of use and a certain amount of illiquidity. Therefore, commodity money can never compete when placed on an even footing with debt-free government-issued money. A gold-only money system has never, never served the cause of freedom, freedom for the common people of any nation at any time in history. It does bring freedom, but only for the top 1%, the owners of the majority of gold. So here's what we can agree on. A gold-only money system can cause monetary stability, theoretically, but it can also be manipulated, and just as it was in King Henry's time. Um, you see, the vast majority of us want economic stability. In fact, that's what the so-called science of economics is supposed to be all about, to create a stable platform for all of us to be able to use fairly and equally, one which is created in the public interest. But, has this been the case for the past hundred years? No. The privately owned central bank system that has virtually taken over the world has done nothing but run up all kinds of debt, creating a constant churning of the economy with booms, bubbles, busts, and crashes. We the people never make out from these instabilities, but someone does. For every loser, there's a winner somewhere. So yes, a gold-only money system uh, theoretically can create stability if the owners of gold want stability. An example of this was in the post-Civil War period in America where we saw periods of spectacular economic expansion 
punctuated by severe and deliberate contractions in the money supply, and this was all under a gold-only money system. Why? So that the money masters could milk the American economy for their benefit. Remember, stability benefits all citizens equally. Instability benefits the money masters. And if you don't mind, I'm, I'm just going to stop here because this is, this, is, uh, this is driving me crazy. I can't show my slides. <laughs> yeah. Ellen, yeah. Putting up, they're, they're putting it up on their website, and it was so. Any other questions that I can answer? Consp uh, Conspiracy Con 2013, I think, is the website. Let, yeah. Let me, uh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. yeah I just, I just want to say, so there's a social network associated with this conference. It's pba2013.pathable.com, and all of these presentations. Uh, will be posted there. It's open to the public, so not only will bills be posted there, but everybody else's. So, so that's a great resource for everyone. PBA2013.pathable, P-A-T-H-A-B-L-E dot com. It's just go to publicbanking.org. There's a link to it. Uh, check with the folks out there, okay? Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Public, yeah. Publicbanking.org. Uh, you, you said uh, the two takeaways was one, take back government. Right. Two, um, and you, the second one, you, you, you succinctly used gold in your description. Can you tell us what the second one is without talking about gold? Yeah, well, there, there are actually three takeaways as far as. Uh, he, he just wanted to know what the takeaways were, which, of course, I, I finish up with in a grand style here. But I'll just, I'll just tell you, I, I can remember this much. And, and that is number one. The number one thing that we have to accomplish, in my opinion, is we have to eliminate the ability of the federal government to borrow. Because governments, all, when they, they run up a national debt, they're always borrowing the majority of that from who? Commercial banks. And so, you know, what the Bible tells us in Proverbs is that, is that the borrower shall be servant to the lender. And that's absolutely true. So when you have your government borrowing essentially from the biggest banks, uh, both uh, uh, private commercial banks and central banks, domestic and, and foreign, then basically you have for the very definition of what political science calls a plutocracy ruled by the rich. You know, that only guarantees that no effective legislation will ever come out of the U.S. Congress as long as they're borrowing. You can't just pay down the national debt. You have to eliminate, make illegal by a constitutional amendment, the ability of the federal government to borrow because nothing can proceed. But uh, nothing but a bankocracy. No legislation will ever come out of Congress. So it will be effective, in our opinion, as long as the government is borrowing. Number two, you have to eliminate the ability of banks to uh, uh, effectively uh, counterfeit American money through fractional reserve lending. And uh, number three, you, of course, have to reissue uh, sovereign debt free. Uh, uh, government issued money. And those are the three steps that we need to take in probably that order. Yeah. Well, like, like well, if you're talking about issuing U.S. notes, is that, yeah, he, he wants to know uh, what, how I feel about nationalizing currency. And I assume what he means is, is the reissuance of U.S. notes instead of Federal Reserve notes. Would that be fair to say? Yes, but also how would you incorporate state rights in 
Well, it's a good intermediate solution because you're clawing back. He, he asked, how, how would I incorporate the state banking, I assume? So, yeah, it's a good intermediate solution because you're, you're clawing back some of that money power from uh, the New York Money Center banks. And uh, we've, we already have the perfect example. This is not a wild theoretical experiment. We have an, uh, a nearly 100-year-long experiment with the State Bank of North Dakota, and it's working great. So, yeah, I, that's a great intermediate solution. But until you eliminate the ability of the federal government to borrow, nothing's going to happen on the federal level, I guarantee you. You know, you've, been, you've, got, you've, you've got to eliminate the ability of, of banks to create money out of nothing uh, through fractional reserve lending. So uh, those are the two things you have to do at the federal level. But everybody always asks, what can we do, you know, at a more personal state uh, level? And state banking is the, is the answer. One more question. Yeah. Uh, in her book, Ellen talks a great deal about uh, the determination of large banks to uh, retain their control practically at any cost. And I'm curious as to whether there has been any action by large banks against the, the Bank of North Dakota as a public bank. Well, he's asking about the history of the, the Bank of North Dakota, and really I think there's only one good book on that, which I've read, and they, they went through quite a struggle uh, creating this bank uh, for the first 20 or 30 years, and then things began to solidify. So, uh, uh, and if you're going to ask me for particulars on how we're going to implement this, I, I can't tell you that. I think that's why we're all here, to hear what everybody's uh, opinions are on that are. I'm kind of the, the history guy and, and can show you what they've done in the past and can, uh, but I can't write the legislation. That's, that's not my thing. But uh, I'm just telling you, I can feel it. The tipping point's coming and what I'm, I'm worried about is, is the next crash because certainly they're blowing another huge, humongous bubble right now. And the next crash is absolutely certain to come. And uh, there's not going to be uh, the resources for them to support themselves the way they have in the past. And so it's, it's going to be much more devastating. And, and if you read what the former president of the World Bank has said, he's been very explicit about his goal, and that is to uh, return the entire world to an international currency based on gold. That is their goal. That's what they want. because. Gold is easy for them to control, and that's not what, what, what we want. We want individual sovereign monies. You know, what's, what's the basic concept of the U.S. Constitution that runs throughout the document, but is nowhere mentioned in the document? It's called the separation of powers concept, and that's where, where power is spread out to the maximum possible extent. What's the separation of powers concept on the international level? It's the, in, it's the individual sovereign nation state. So we have to maintain those individual sovereign nation states, and, and each of them should be in control of their own individual uh, national money. Ellen says I have to go now. <laughs> <laughs>